Hello everyone and welcome to SciComm Monday. I'm your host, Nicole Wood. Uh, if you're new to SciComm Monday, uh, we are a live streaming uh, format here. So what we try to do is make this as engaging as possible. So any questions you have during the broadcast, uh, please feel free to use the Periscope chat module to uh, send in your questions. If you're watching this on replay after the live broadcast, uh, please feel free to uh, send your questions in via Twitter. So you can either uh, reach the broadcast either at the SciComm Monday handle or at my personal handle of Wildlife BioGal. And then uh, today's guest is uh, Jillian Morris Brake. Uh, she's uh, gonna be talking to us all about the shark outreach that she does uh, down in the Bahamas. And so with that, I'd like to uh, bring uh, Jillian onto the broadcast. Uh, thank you for being here, Jillian. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to connect with your audience and, and talk a little bit about um, some of the work that I do with students and some of the shark science I'm, I'm working on currently. So uh, why don't you give us a little bit of uh, background as to how you got to where you are now? I mean, how does one just randomly end up in the Bahamas doing shark um, research? <laughs> One who doesn't like cold weather anymore is is a good start. Um, I'm actually from Maine, uh, born and raised. I uh, grew up crawling through tide pools and, and not minding the cold weather when I was young and just really excited about the ocean, loved all ocean animals and uh, proudly told my parents at the age of five that I was going to be a marine biologist. And I think they probably just said, sure, okay, and, and uh, thought that that would just be a phase and on to the next thing, but uh, it wasn't a phase. It didn't go away, and so I continued a journey and swam with my first shark when I was nine years old on a family trip to Florida and was just amazed, thought it was the coolest thing, loved all ocean animals, so it wasn't just sharks at, the, at that point, but was so excited. It was a nurse shark, um, so that sort of started my lifelong love with nurse sharks. And uh, so, yeah, just kind of worked from that point and, and studying and getting any books I could. And then that sort of evolved through um, deciding to focus on that at university, actually studied behavioral biology because uh, that's kind of what I was more interested in. And then immediately started working on a research boat in Florida um, that ventured to the Bahamas and I was kind of exposed to the Bimini Shark Lab, which is a world-renowned research station. And if you love sharks, you've probably heard of that place. You've seen it on Shark Week or other documentaries. And so, um, yeah, connected with them, did a couple projects, and then, you know, traveled all over the world. Worked in Australia, I was traveling to Indonesia, uh, diving, leading shark diving trips, really sort of combined all of these um, opportunities and, and ways to stay in the ocean, to share the ocean with people, and to study the ocean. And really all of that revolved around sharks and kept finding myself in the Bahamas. And after years, um, you know, met my husband and we were spending time in the Bahamas. We met in the Bahamas uh, diving with tiger sharks. So all these kind of huge neon signs that kept leading me back. And, and so finally we just decided that in order to do kind of the shark conservation work, the film and video and the science, the Bahamas was the place to be. And the icing on the cake was kind of no snow, which I was a big, big fan of and, and much warmer weather. So uh, yeah, so it, it really started at a very young age and then um, kind of this amazing journey that ended up in this incredible place, this little island called Bimini in the Bahamas. So what makes uh, Bemini so amazing for uh, shark research and the shark outreach that you do? Is it just the warm water? Is there like something special with the number of sharks and different shark species that you're seeing there? Like what is it that makes it so amazing that just completely drew you in that you're still there? So yeah, the Bimini Shark Lab is there and, and they've been there um, since 1990. So uh, I had traveled there knowing that I was gonna see sharks. Bimini is kind of really interesting with the different ecosystems that it actually has. It's very close to the Gulf Stream, which is deep water. Um, so you get pelagic species cruising through. Um, and then you also get um, all these animals that are starting their life in the mangrove nurseries. And this is a really important point considering the hurricane that just passed through. Um, a lot of damage 
damage was done in Caribbean islands that have seen habitat destruction, loss of mangroves. Um, people often don't get very excited about mangroves or understand necessarily how important they really are. Uh, they provide this incredible habitat for animals above and below the surface. And I think people are really surprised when I say, yeah, there's sharks in the mangroves. People are like, wait a minute, a forest, sharks, that doesn't really... Those aren't words you would put together normally, but um, the root system provides incredible habitat for hiding out. So it's a refuge for these little animals. Um, you'll see juvenile lemon sharks and nurse sharks, but you also see juvenile conch, lobster, snapper, and these are all economically extremely important species um, for these island nations that rely heavily on fishing. So um, these are really, really important animals. Uh, young turtles, birds, snakes, uh, reef fish before they're large enough to actually venture out into the coral reefs. So this habitat is, is one of the most economically um, and environmentally valuable ecosystems ecosystems throughout the world. And it also acts as a very strong storm barrier. So uh, we just saw on our South Island, because there's two islands, that minimal damage happened, minimal flooding, because of the amount of mangroves that we have. Other islands that have removed their mangroves didn't fare as well. Um, and so we have this huge mangrove forest system, um, less in size than it used to be, unfortunately, because we have had some habitat destruction. And then you also have seagrass beds, coral reefs, so you have quite a diversity in, in particular ecosystems, which means there's a lot of different shark species that can thrive and survive there. Um, you also see species migrate in and out at different times of the year. The great hammerheads spend the winter months there. As the water gets cooler, they come up from deeper waters into the shallows. We're able to dive with them. So you've really got kind of this unique mix of ecosystems that can support a lot of different species. So um, it means that the shark populations have remained fairly healthy um, and they're also fairly diverse. So if you want to work with sharks to any capacity, it really is an ideal place um, to be based to be able to have access to them. Yeah, you made a, a lot of really good uh, points there, especially with the mangroves about how they do such a good job of not only providing shelter for young fish that are living there. We have the same uh, thing up here in the Great Lakes where we have our coastal wetlands that that's where a lot of our young fish go to live you know it provides them that habitat structure for protection and also that food that they need but then it also provides you know structure and protection for like our beaches and other areas so our shorelines don't get completely washed away up here and so while we might have you know different types of wetlands we don't have mangroves up here in the great lakes they provide a lot of the same services that you're saying and it's so important to protect them and keep them safe because we don't think about these tiny little sharks or maybe, you know, some of our tiny little lake trout that are living, you know, up here in the Great Lakes, you know, living in those little areas. And it's so important to keep them safe. So is, is there like a good, you know, is there a good call or a good, you know, um, outreach, you know, program of like, you know, reaching people there to like sh let them know how important those may grows are and they, are they doing a good job of trying to protect them? Or is it still kind of one of those issues of where it's really a struggle to protect the mangroves down there? So throughout the Bahamas, uh, there are organizations, Bahamas National Trust, um, Brief, larger organizations that are working to protect and establish larger marine protected areas. Um, unfortunately, the marine protected area that has been called for in Bimini has not been finalized. Uh, hopefully in the near future, that's going to happen, particularly seeing how important they are after this. This is a very relevant issue right now. Um, and so... Uh, and other islands, but Bimini is really small, so a lot of the conservation work that is done is either visiting um, conservationists or the Shark Lab, which is kind of running programs and outreach. So when I brought Sharks for Kids is actually based in Florida, but because I live in Bimini, we do a lot of outreach work there. And so we work with the students and we take them out to see the mangroves. Um, these kids live on an island. The mangroves are at the edges and they can see them, but a lot of them have never actually been to the mangroves. Um, and so getting local kids out to see uh, the animals that are there, uh, the structure it provides, the habitat, and getting to snorkel and, and see really connect with those, those animals and understand the importance firsthand because they're standing there, they're seeing it, that's really powerful. And we want 
these local kids to, to understand what is around them, what, what's in their backyard in order to be a voice in the future and to continue to be a voice um, to support conservation efforts. So when they're old enough to vote, when they're old enough to decide, um, you know, how they're going to spend their money or when they're working as a, a dive master or a biologist or a fisherman or fisherwoman, like, you know, whatever their future holds for a career, how it all connects to systems like the mangroves. Um, and I think even if they're learning about it in school, if you actually get them out there to physically be in the mangroves and and take part in that and really dive into it literally, um, that is so much more powerful in, in connecting them. That becomes a lifelong journey for them. And that's really what the goal is. Sharks make it exciting, I think, but really it's it's all the environments. And, and so that's kind of the work we're doing in the Bahamas. Yeah, that's a really good uh, point of, you know, getting that hands-on experience for you know, not only kids, but anyone else to get them super interested. So I've thrown up one of the pictures here that you shared with me, which is, I believe, some of the local kids there from Bimini actually getting experience being out on the boat and seeing sharks with the uh, Sharks for Kids program. So can you tell us a little bit more of like what ages you're shooting for to get them out there and what experiences do you actually give them when they're, you know, out and doing those hands-on activities? Yeah, so we're really lucky. There's a, a great dive operation, um, Neil Watson's Bimini Scuba Center, and they've been very supportive. They want to help the community. They want to be involved. And so we partner with them to take local kids out. This picture is actually um, was of some local middle school girls, uh, because I really think having access to STEM programs and just these outreach programs for girls is particularly important. Um, a big part of the work we do, a lot of the STEM projects we do are geared towards women uh, and girls to so for them to understand that, yes, girls shark dive, yes, girls go out in the mangroves, yes, girls are biologists, they're shark scientists, and have access that, yes, you're Bahamian, you live here, this is for you too. This is absolutely something you can do. I'm not from here, but I love these islands, and I want you to see why I love these islands, why people are traveling from around the world to come see the animals on your doorstep. And so we take them out. We usually either take them into the mangroves to kind of have that experience or we have a stingray site kind of like Stingray City in Grand Cayman, but we have a smaller version so we can get them out. They can stand on the beach, watch the stingrays or then kind of work their way into the water and and have an interaction with these. Uh, It's a provisioning site. So for 30 plus years, people have fed these stingrays. So they do come up so the kids can interact. They can see them. They can touch them, learn about them. And then we usually move out into a bit deeper water and take them to see Caribbean reef sharks. Uh, Again, one of the most iconic species throughout the Bahamas, um, huge economic value, divers coming into the Bahamas specifically to see these animals. So um, yeah, it's really to just help them understand and experience what all these people are spending a lot of money to come to come do and see so that they're the future of these animals and these islands that they're going to continue to fight to protect them. Yeah, it's it's um, one of the things like, you know, I've got a young niece and nephew. My nephew is nine and my niece is seven. And it's, you know, one thing I've really tried to stress with them is, you know, educating them all about, you know, nature and everything else. So that way, when it gets to be time for them to say, like you were talking about earlier, you know, to vote and make those critical decisions, they'll have that background knowledge of which to be able to make those choices that you would hope would be protecting our world and, you know, helping to keep those species around that we desperately need. And you really like, I mean, you got to hit them while they're young. I mean, my niece right now, like she just finished first grade and on one of her sheets, she says, I want to be a bird biologist. And so it's so exciting to get her, you know, just super pumped about going out and being involved in STEM. And so if you can do that on a larger scale, like for me, it's, you know, I can influence my niece, but you're influencing, you know, dozens to hundreds of kids with your program. And so that's really good. You can spread that message out to all of these girls and get them super excited about being in STEM that give them those career choices that they might not have realized otherwise. Um, Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think it's really important is is just not – it's important for all the kids in the Bahamas. Uh, it's currently a shark sanctuary, so it's illegal to, to target sharks and kill them there. And it would be nice to see that continue. And so if we want to, that to continue and we want conservation efforts to continue, these local kids have to understand why it's important and how it affects their lives, uh, not just environmentally but economically. Um, they released a study uh, from 2015. Uh, Pew did it along with the Island School and the Cape Luther Institute. And sharks and rays generate $113.8 million to the Bahamian economy every year from people coming to the Bahamas to see these animals. That is a huge amount of money. And that that shows you just the the side of both the economic and the environmental importance of these animals. And so this will affect their lives. This is their parents' jobs. This is going to be their jobs, their uncle's job, the food they eat, um, you know, the careers that they pursue and the life that they live in the future um, is heavily influenced on the ocean. And sharks and rays are a huge part of that. So um, I think it we absolutely it's it's our responsibility to help these kids um, understand their connection to that and, and why it matters. And, and, you know, that's why I do a lot and we choose to do a lot of work in the Bahamas because I, it's so necessary. It has to happen because these kids are the voice and anywhere that applies anywhere. It's just, I, you know, I'm, I'm there and it's, it's my home and I love these islands and, um, you know, I really want to do everything I can to help preserve them and have them, this beauty remain and there's so many areas that are still pretty untouched and it'd be nice to keep them that way if we can yeah and getting them that experience is so important uh you know here in the great lakes uh we found out recently that one of our major cities grand rapids which is only about 30 miles away from lake michigan which is one of the five great lakes there's some kids there that have never been out to the great lakes you have never actually physically seen it and it's just like it was just was so sad and so they've started developing programs that will actually take those kids out to the lake, you know, during middle school so they can get that experience and see it and be able to like learn about it and start to treasure it. Cause yeah, as you said, like it's a big economic, you know, boost to us here up in this area, just like it is with, you know, you down there in the Bahamas, it's, you know, you have to be educated in that area. Otherwise that economy is just going to nosedive and then you're out of jobs and livelihoods. And then there goes your local area. So absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I want to send out a, a quick reminder to everyone that if you have any questions for uh, Jillian or myself during the broadcast, uh, please feel free to submit them uh, via the uh, live chat module here on uh, Periscope, and we'll do our best to uh, get them answered. And then it also, if you're watching this on replay, uh, feel free to uh, send those in via our various uh, Twitter handles uh, for the show. It's SciComm Monday, uh, or my personal handle, Wildlife Biogal, or for uh, Jillian, it's a uh, at Bimini gal, or sorry, at Bimini shark gal, girl. Wow, jeez, I'm getting them all messed up. There's just too many Twitter <laughs> handles to remember sometimes. So it's a uh, Bimini shark girl for uh, Jillian. So um, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more of uh, what else that you do? Like you do some uh, photography and other things. Like where has your work been featured that we might be able to like see it if we wanted to go out and uh, find it? Yeah. So. Um kind of most of my adult life now revolves around shark work, um, whether it's shark tagging, I still participate and I'm actually co-leading a scientific study in the Dutch Caribbean. Um, unfortunately, that's been kind of put on hold due to Irma's wrath. And uh, um, I also do a lot of photography and, and video work. Um, it's used as a tool. It's great. It helps us build materials and content for Sharks for Kids uh, because having photos and videos is really, really important. Um, and showing kids like, you know, showing kids how close I am with a tiger shark and, and having access to that and being able to use those materials, uh, is really, really important firsthand experiences. Um, but I've done a lot of filming for different animal planet shows, um, national geographic, BBC. Um, so, uh, and still do, I was on a shark week episode this past shark week. Um, and we'll be working on another uh, show next year. So still do some film work and photography, uh, and then also the science, and then running Sharks for Kids full time is really that's that's my passion project. I, I really really believe that students, um, kids all over the world have a voice, and I think oftentimes that's overlooked, and we don't really 
give them enough credit for what they're able to do and and the voice that they have and the the words that they say and the actions that they take really does make a difference. And so if we can do something to empower them and give them the facts and the tools to help them have a stronger voice or have confidence in that voice and realize that, okay, I'm five, yeah, I can still do something. I could still be part of this. I can still choose to not use a plastic straw or clean up the beach or make a cool shark poster to share at school. All very easy things that they can do that every single simple little action that we take, it adds up. And, and helping them to understand that. And so that's that's really my passion project. Um, I just recently did photography for a book called Sharks of the Shallows, which is out, um, shark species in Florida and the Bahamas. Um, so did a lot of photography for that. Um, I've also written my own children's book called Norman the Nurse Shark because I love nurse sharks and I think they're great ambassadors for kids not maybe as toothy or as exciting as a great white, but definitely still very, very important. And uh, so that was a fun adventure. Uh, so yeah, I've, it's a lot of different things, but it all really kind of focuses around sharks and, and shark conservation and the different outlets uh, to get that message or different messages regarding that out there. Well, uh, we just had a question came in and you kind of like just almost answered it with um, the Norman, the nurse shark book. It was, the question was like, how do you get a four year old uh, interested in sharks that, you know, aren't eating humans? And so that's a really good way is, you know, to write, you know, some materials, you know, design more for kids uh, that will get them interested. And, in, you know, maybe those non like, you know, eye catching sharks that we all see, you know, with the great whites jumping out of the water and all that kind of stuff that gets exciting but you know get them excited about other sharks too like but how else do you get them really excited about you maybe some of those other species that aren't as well known well I think I'm always surprised at how young kids are when they say to me oh sharks are man eaters a four-year-old shouldn't think that a four-year-old shouldn't have seen that or, or seen something that indicates that so I always am, am shocked at that and realize that we you know, as many people that love sharks and are excited about them, we still have work to do. And so I think at that age, really young, getting kids just excited that these are awesome animals. Every animal is exciting and interesting, and sharks are part of that. Um, dispelling the, the myths right away. They're not man-eating monsters. Okay, let's get kids excited about the really cool things that they do that are factual. Um, and so coloring sheets, fun fact sheets, like everybody loves to color that, you know, so we do a lot with coloring sheets and activities and um, kind of creative outlets for the kids to get excited. But epaulette sharks that can walk. I mean, that's amazing. Most people wouldn't think sharks can walk and kids are always like, whoa, that's so cool. And it is. Um, and it's a little shark or just simply that some have glow in the dark bellies. Uh, some can invert their stomachs, like essentially a tiger shark can throw up its own stomach, which kids think is absolutely disgusting, but awesome because it is. Uh, so just helping them realize there's so much more to these animals than just their teeth and that fin, right? That big dorsal fin swimming through the water and themed music. And there's so much more to these animals and these incredible adaptations they have, um, different habitats, different shapes, sizes, colors, really um, beyond the species that they know, the tiger shark, the great hammerhead, the great white. Um, and we do that through curriculum, through videos, through photography, and, you know, these great coloring fact sheets. I've, we've had a lot of fun with, with different artists uh, using their incredible talents to help us teach kids the weird and wonderful um, things about different sharks. So, yeah, that they go, okay. Um, I love it when a kid, when I ask them, they're like, Wobby Gong. And I'm like, ah, that's amazing. I want them to, to come up with different names or um, Greenland sharks. And uh, it's always really uh, exciting when they know something beyond the most common species. I think it means we're, we're getting the message out there and um, helping them really, you know, at the heart of it is there's so much more to these animals than their teeth. And that's really what all of our projects are kind of stemming from is, is to help kids realize that and the different tools that we can use to do that. Yeah, so uh, there was a comment that came in and it you know, leads to a really good question is, what kind of big myths are there out there with sharks that you know, most of the public you know, thinks of and we always think of them say as being man eaters, but what are some of the other myths that you know, maybe that the, the general public or, you know, just different audiences might not know about, you know, and should be educated on when it comes to sharks. 
I, I mean, obviously the biggest myth is that they're they're man eaters and that they swim around. There's uh, rogue sharks; they'll target humans and and swim around, and and that's just not the reality. Sharks are not ro- they don't go rogue, and um, we've got this, you know. Unfortunately, sharks fit into this sort of monster stereotype that ends up in movies with alligators and and big snakes and and all these things. And yes, they are wild animals. They have teeth. They can be very large. They are predators, but that doesn't mean they're monsters. Um, but humans have put them into that kind of category. Um, and so people assume that if you go in the ocean, it's not safe. Um, you know, human blood, they're attracted to human blood. That We get asked that all the time. We've done experiments where we've put human blood in the water with sharks and have not had them attack the device or people um it's yes they can smell it but it with these particular species lemon sharks and reef sharks um they weren't attracted to it um so i think those are kind of the biggest myths but also that if um there are no sharks there'd be more fish i've heard that one a lot and uh that's not the case at all i mean it's a it's a delicate balance and not every shark is an apex predator but some of them are and they do play a critical role in the ecosystem um but just this kind of hysteria and fear around these animals, even for people that have never, ever seen one or maybe not even been in the ocean. Um, it's, it's incredible that how much misinformation is out there around one type of animal. And uh, that's what blows my mind is just how far reaching and how the strength of these myths um, and, uh, so yeah, working with kids to, to help them understand the facts from the fiction, um, is also helping adults because if they go home and say, you know, guess what? I've, I've shared this fact. This is a really cool thing. They're not monsters. Maybe their parents will start thinking differently or look it up, or maybe it's something they do with mom or dad or a brother or sister and look up and see some fun facts and, and engage each other. And it starts a conversation and, that's where a lot can be accomplished is a simple conversation. And so these are all kind of key pieces, I think, for starting conversations. And, you know, I remember going home from school, if I learned something really cool or exciting, or somebody brought something interesting at show and tell, I went home and told my family about it. I mean, and, uh, and we get a lot of notes from parents and teachers that are parents, that that's what's happening. The kids are just buzzing about it and can't wait and that to me is a success when you get that you can give them the information and if they sit there and go okay that's cool but it's when they continue on and they start a conversation and they are reaching out to their friends and family and and finding that voice that's when we have success and that's when we we know we're making an impact and these kids are making an impact yeah, I know that's, uh, so my niece did a, a report on spider monkeys last year during school, and she was showing me the report afterwards because I helped her connect with some scientists on Twitter so she could get, get some information on it. And I was reading it afterwards, and there was stuff in there I didn't know. So it works on ants, too. It's not just parents and siblings. Ants, you know, can get some cool information from kids learning that's about things. Nice. So, and it was just like, it was so great. Like, here I am in a college, and I'm learning something from my you know, then six-year-old niece about Aww. spider monkeys. And that was mm-hmm. so great. Oh, well, we're just about out of time here. So I'm going to uh, just uh, any last moments, you know, things like what's, I guess, what's the coolest thing that you really love about sharks? What's like the big thing that just makes you like just in love with sharks? Um, I just think that we use that one word, but it's really, there's so many incredible things about these animals and we're learning new stuff every, every single day, new things are being discovered and learned. So it's, it's constantly exciting. It's evolving. And I think for me, um, having had some remarkable moments with these animals, it's always interesting every day. I have the ability to learn something new. The world has the ability to learn something new. How can you not appreciate that and, and be absolutely fascinated by that? So just, I, I, I think the incredible diversity within the word shark and what that means is what for me is I is I'm just absolutely fascinated by it. Great. Well, I, it's definitely, uh, I think, inspiring what you're doing with kids and all the, the outreach that you're doing. It's just, it's great to see that people are really that invested in the future of educating folks when it comes to the various species out there. So definitely a great job and uh, keep it up. And it was uh, great having you on here. I really appreciate you coming on SciCom Monday today, Jillian. 
Mm, thank you so much for having me and uh, for letting me share a little bit of my work with you. Thank you. And thank you for this great program, too. I think it's really, really important for people to to see uh, and get exposed to the different science and uh, the way we're sharing it with people around the world. So thank you, because it really is important work. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad you had fun. So if uh, we didn't get to all of your uh, questions today, and I know there was a few of them that came in late, uh, feel free to uh, tweet uh, Jillian at her handle, which is uh, at Bimini Shark Girl. And if you have any uh, questions for uh, myself or the broadcast, you can either tweet me at SciComm Monday or at my personal handle of Wildlife BioGal. And then just a reminder, we're going to be uh, off uh, next week because I'll be traveling, but then uh, tune in uh, the week after uh, in October and we'll start uh, the broadcast uh, back up again with some uh, fun uh, ornithology uh, related uh, broadcast uh, then. And then for um, everyone, I just want to uh, make sure that uh, we go through and do a quick uh, couple of thank yous here. So I want to uh, thank everyone that is our uh, Patreon sponsors. Uh, thank you very much for helping to uh, support the program. It uh, really helps make it possible. Uh, and I want to send a, a big thank you out to uh, Jason Leathers. He goes by I for MSU on Twitter. He's one of our, our major Patreon sponsors and a big, big uh, thank you to him for uh, helping out the broadcast. And if you liked what you uh, saw today, uh, please go visit our Patreon account. Uh, any help that you can give is uh, definitely appreciated. And then if you're a scientist or a science communicator out there and you want to come on SciComm Monday, We'd love to have you. Uh, we've had a lot of really great people on the broadcast uh, throughout this past year since we started it up, and we'd love to keep it going. So uh, feel free to uh, DM me either at uh, the SciComm Monday account or at my personal account, and uh, we can talk about uh, getting you scheduled in for a future broadcast. And so with that, I'd like to uh, uh, thank everyone for um, tuning in today. Uh, go out, explore, do some science, have some fun, and we'll see you on the next SciComm Monday.